another place. And then and I was like, okay, so what's the number? He's like, oh, well, I see myself having like 10 places. I was like, oh, what will you be doing then? Uh, well, I'll be overseeing all of that stuff. <laughs> so it's like, right. So your dream is, is to be a, a coach and to pass on this thing, but then you're going to very quickly transition away from that. And this kind of, it kind of sent him an aha moment. And I guess we get our best aha moments when we teach people, right? Yes. And I just kind of realized there that I'd created this thing that had moved me not entirely away from, but, you know, I was doing 20 hours of coaching a week, but, um, but I was spending 60 hours doing admin and, uh, and making sure that the, uh, the building was functioning and the wheels were running on time and uh, stressing over the numbers and, and actually probably not showing up for those 20 people as deeply as I could. And, uh, and then I came over to Denmark. We were visiting my father-in-law who, uh, who was very sick and, and I kept being called away with, with admin challenges and, and building challenges that, that I didn't really care about. And didn't want to be wasting my time on and uh, sure. I just had this moment and I just turned to my wife and said hey do you fancy moving here it seemed like the only reason that we weren't moving was that we had a big business in the UK right but but actually I knew that I could build a business quite easily you know it's the thing that I can do mm-hmm. but I couldn't fix my family um, and I couldn't create all of this time and I couldn't move my house to the beach and loads of things that I wanted. Um, and it all just kind of fell into place and and we moved here and, uh, very quickly, um, as, uh, as I've kind of started penning, penning a book about it, actually very quickly, I just started meeting people for coffee. Oh, I I saw that. Great idea. (laughs) Well, I said, uh, I said to my wife one, um, it was, we'd moved here like six months and we hadn't worked. We just kind of relaxed for six months and we were away skiing. And I was like, I feel like doing something in, in this country, um, in Denmark, but I don't know what, what I'll do. And, and I was kind of talking to her about what my, what my kind of my strengths were and the stuff that I've been doing for a really long time, which kind of put me at a, a disproportionate advantage. And she said, well, the thing that I've, has always struck me is that from the age of four years old, living in the country, you've been knocking on kids' doors and asking them if they want to come out and play. And so I was like, you're right. That, that's, that's the way to build my business. It's not going to be networking or necessarily social media. It's just knocking on people's doors and finding out what they're up to. Yes. And, and that's what I started doing. And uh, 500 coffees later, I sit here coaching CEOs all over Copenhagen to, to optimize their physical and mental performance. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. Well, you know, just reading that about your, in your backstory uh, also was a reason that I contacted you because I thought, well, God, if this guy has, you know, been willing to talk to 500 people, he must, you know, he must be a good conversationist. And uh, <laughs> so he won't be a stick in the mud. <laughs> So uh, anyway, that was, yeah, that, I think that's helpful for, uh, for people to know. They know you're, you know, an, an outgoing, socially, you know, fun guy and, and not just uh, like when I got it started, uh, I was kind of a fanatical fitness guy, you know, and uh, was not any fun to be around, I think, unless you were like, you know, some other fanatics. But uh, anyway, back to your story or back to, to your, let's, if we could change, change gears a little bit. Uh, you mentioned the the CEOs that come into you, and uh, um, could we um, imagine? Let's you know, without get, with just met an imaginary uh, CEO comes in today uh, and says, "Hey, Ed, I've heard about you. I'd like to get started as soon as possible. Um, I'm you know, I'm overweight. I'm overstressed. Uh, my I'm working too much. Uh, my my kids are not happy with me. My wife is not happy with me. Can you help me?" How would you start? Well, the, uh, the interesting thing, right, is that people don't go to somebody to get the best prescription. They think that they do, mm-hmm. but they go to somebody to get the best diagnosis. 
Right? Okay. You don't walk into your doctor and say, I don't feel very well. And the doctor goes, here you go. Here's a prescription. Right? The doctor asks questions. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, when somebody goes to a GP who's paid by the, for the number of people they get to see, a lot of people go away, let's say, slightly disenfranchised, right? Because they yes. don't feel like they've had the thorough diagnosis. You know, it's um, only 76% of people that go to the doctor pick up the prescription. And then only half of those actually follow the prescription. And it's because they feel disenfranchised by the whole process. They don't feel like the, the looking up on Google and the tapping here and the tapping there was enough of a diagnosis for the patient and the doctor to both be looking at this problem together and going, hey, here's what I'm looking for. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's the data. You can see the data. We've got this thing together. So what I do with everybody is I give them the best diagnosis they've ever had. And, um, and that, is, that is of primary importance because when somebody has so much clarity around what's going wrong, the next best step just becomes incredibly logical rather than me going that I've got the keys to the tower and you know nothing. All of a sudden I've gone, hey, here's, here's how much oxygen is going flowing in your body. Here's what your cerebellum is doing and why your balance isn't good, and why you're not actually moving that much. And here's what the muscles down the center of your body are causing to happen. Here's the tension it's causing. And I, every little test that I do reveals something about their story that every single, I can tell them their story of what's going on in their life by what's going on in their body and the stories that they're telling me that I just get to reflect back to them. And it's, like I said, it's, it becomes uh, the two of us sat on the same side of the table looking at the problem. So I go, here's the diagnosis. And I want you to tell me what's the best next step for you in each of these areas. So it all comes down to diagnosis. And when there's diagnosis, there's doubt. And the first step of transformation is doubt. Because if you believe you're going the right way, you don't, you keep going down the same road, right? It's not until you have total clarity around the idea that you're going the wrong way that you're willing and able to adopt this thing, right? Because when someone goes to a doctor, they go, hey, doc, I believe I'm doing everything right, but this anomaly has just occurred. So the, the job is, the job then is to sow the doubt, to show the diagnosis, to create the doubt, to create the first transformation that is, I'm going the wrong way. And then you go, what's the right way? Ah, okay. So that's, that's the first thing. Yeah. Okay. That's brilliant. That's, that's, def that's brilliant. So, so when you, so that allows the person to open their mind to maybe I need to go have a different change, pa change pass or change the map or change the orientation and uh and allows them to be open to it instead of fighting it like as so many people do because uh it's uh i see it so common with um with friends and family in the states that uh that are really just a, they have a they, they they would say they have a sweet tooth but really they're addicted to sugar and it's so easy to uh you know starting off with kids cereals and things like that. I mean, it's such a, it's such a battle to keep, uh, for our, for myself included with our son to keep him away from sugar. If he goes to visit, you know, the grandparents and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so, uh, do you ever, have you dealt with people who've, who've had food addiction issues or th things like that? Right. So, um, so the way that I tend to, to look at that is that, um, it's a habit, right? It's a, and um, a habit is a, a habitual thought, word, action that, that we do consistently. And what creates a habit is, is well, an, an action is determined by the inner dialogue, right? The conversation that goes in our, in our brain that says, take this action. And before that, there are just thoughts. And those thoughts make up that inner dialogue and we don't quite realize that we've got this stubborn part of our inner dialogue 
the, that, that tends to make those decisions is not the rational one, it's the habitual one, right? So the hab habit always wins. But before the thought is the emotion. Mm -hmm. And what produces an emotion is an emotion is essentially a concept, uh, a concept of different environmental stimulus and feelings. So we have emotion and then we have feelings. So those feelings might be, um, I'm feeling a little bit sluggish or my stomach is rumbling and the fridge is there, right? So if we just take something really blunt and we go, one of the environmental things is that it's six o'clock in the evening. One of the things is that I'm at home with my family. Another one of those things is that I'm feeling a bit low on energy because I've just got home from work. And another one of those things is that my stomach is rumbling because I know it's nearly dinner time. And then our brain goes, the concept of these things is um, an emotion that drives me towards sugar. So then I consume sugar. And these are all based on associations from the past. They are, mm -hmm. when these things were gathered before, I had sugar and I felt better. Or they are distant past. When these things were gathered together, my dad or my mum used to go and grab a glass of wine. They showed me the end of that equation was this, right? So our habits become that mirror of somebody else's. So if I want to change this thing, I first go, let's lose the word addiction and create the word habit. And, in, and habit uh, is uh, actions based on associations from the past triggered in our current environment. So how do I change those associations? Uh, well, first and foremost, I, I need to decide what I'm going to do. So what is the habit that I would like to create and why? Well, actually, um, I'm feeling overweight at the moment. And this causes me to not feel that great about myself, which affects how I communicate with other people, which is affecting my job and my relationships. So we get really clear on where we are. This is current reality. This is my diagnosis of my current state. And then we go, okay, so what do I want to do? Well, I want to change that. So I'm going to stop eating sugar at six o'clock in the evening, right? So I'm not gonna go all cold turkey. I'm just gonna say this, this glass of wine and this or whatever that I have at six, I'm going to stop that. Now you could go cold turkey. You just go, you're going to make the decision. This is the decision I'm going to make. And here's what I, what I expect to notice. Okay. Um, so I've got clarity of reality and I've got an objective. And then I want to go, how do I need to set up my environment to make that easier? So is that, do I need to remove stuff from my environment? So it's not there. Um, how am I setting up my environment at the moment to sabotage myself? Or how would I set up my environment to sabotage myself? Well, I would, I would, I would have that there and I wouldn't have something else there to do instead, for example. So now I'm constructing the environment around me. Now the next step is caveats and caveats are really important. And they are basically, I'm going to do this unless, and because it's always a random unless that trips us up in a habit. You know, if we say, I'm going to stop drinking wine every evening, and then our, a mate comes to town that, that always has a glass of wine with us, but we only see them once every six months or something, right? And the mm -hmm. friend says, do you want a glass of wine? Let's share a glass of wine. And then you go, oh, okay, let's have one. The next day you wake up in the morning and you think everything is normal, but you get to six o'clock and your brain has already concocted a reason why a you reason should why. do it again. <laughs> All right? Yes. And it's because your brain lacked that prediction and response. It no longer felt safe. And because it didn't feel safe, it went back to the old habit. Whereas if you'd have created that caveat in advance, I do this habit and less this, your brain will allow for it. Ah, because okay. it's creating That's certainty in advance. That's okay. That's a, that's an interesting, interesting way to, very interesting way to look at it. It's sort of like, yeah, planning, planning for plan. Yeah. By planning for that situation and ahead of time, you still can, can maintain the momentum that you built up with the new habit. 
Absolutely. So your brain only needs to know that you've got a plan to feel safe. Right. It, right. Yeah. yeah so, and yeah, then so you just say, oh, when's the, when's the deadline? I don't, I want my brain to feel safe. So we're not going to do this forever. Let's do a 30 day experiment. And then, and then the next part is we are, we are connection and hierarchically motivated mammals, right? Once we've established connection, we want hierarchy. That's just kind of how the, our brain works, okay? So we want to allow for that. We can use that against ourselves by saying, here's what I'm doing. I'm gonna tell somebody that I care about. I'm gonna tell my wife, hey, I don't want you to hold me accountable for this, to this. I'm just telling you, I'm not gonna be drinking wine at six o'clock in the evening at all and what happens there is that we've done what we said we'd do and when we do what we said we'd do we increase connection with other people around us we increase trust because we become consistent our words and our actions become aligned and we lose trust when our words and our actions are not aligned right you promise your children you'll do something and you don't they will nag you and say, you promised, you right. promised. And eventually you break enough promises, even ones that you judge as small, if they've judged them as important, they start to lose faith in you. Yes. And that's how you build connection with people around you is you do what you said you'd do. And so that's a really powerful way of creating trust in yourself, right? As well as trust. Um, from others around you. So when you make a promise to yourself, all of a sudden your self-esteem goes up and you go, I can do these things. I can build these habits. And that's where momentum starts to form. When your words and your actions are aligned based on the process of just building simple habits like that glass of wine. Okay. Well, this, this was actually an area I was, I was going to ask you, and I think you've already covered it is the, there, you know, when, when someone starts, you know, after letting themselves go in all aspects of their life, perhaps health wise. Um, and uh, so in your experience, it is, it's better to start off with small, small habits, build momentum and not try to change everything at once. Is, is that what you're saying? Uh, so um, the thing that I do with my clients is we will um, create clarity in seven, eight, nine, ten areas of their life inside a one hour conversation. And then we will decide on a maybe a new habit in every single area. Because the only time that it's not possible to take on lots of habits is one, when you're basically adding in really time consuming stuff into your life. And two, when you're using willpower to place it there. But when you're using clarity to place it there, clarity of where you are, then there is no willpower involved in it. You're simply constructing the environment and giving your brain the things that it needs in order to feel safe. Okay, that's fascinating. Can you share with us the areas, I think you mentioned, was it seven areas or? Uh, so it, it'll vary, right? But let's right. take um, the fictitious CEO that you just brought in to see mm -hmm. me. So I would say mental health and say physical health. Um, and then I'd get them to propose some relationships, but they may end up with um, wife, um, child, children, mum, dad, friends. Um, it may be they, their, um, their other founding partner who happens to be the COO or, or something like that, right? They'll, they'll pick on particular relationships that they'd like to strengthen. Mm -hmm. um, then, then we may get into uh, finances, wealth. We may get into um, happiness, purpose, um, inspiration, self-development, growth. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, we're, we're trying to create a broad range of, of all of the constituent parts that make up a human and uh and improve all of them okay well that's that's fun that's yeah quite holistic so 
So that's, a, but that I could see now would allow someone psychologically to, once they've, they've actually shared this and, got, and opened their mind to this, is, uh, is to get a lot more inertia, a lot more momentum going in. Um, I think there's, and there's, a, uh, there's a book called uh, The Power of Why by Simon Sinek, if I remember correctly. Start with why, yeah. Start with why, that's it, yeah. So your start, by doing this process, is that kind of where, could we say you're getting a big why up front with, by including all these areas? Or multiple whys, maybe? Um, I mean, the, I have a, a particular session where I would work on purpose, um, mm -hmm. and purpose being something that, that most of us, have, well, all of us have carried with us our whole lives, and, and they never turn out to be um, to sell this widget, right? But, um, they, they turn out to be the lesson you've been trying to teach your whole life and the lesson that you most wanted to hear your whole life. And, um, and most of us have kind of pushed those things out of our whole lives and the times that we've been most happy, we've been most in alignment and the times we've been least happy, we've been least in alignment with, with those things. Um, but, uh, but, you know, this initial session that I'm talking about is really around somebody um, really connecting with what's true for them. And, and when people, basically people develop to the degree that they are willing to tell themselves the truth. And, uh, you know, I just, I encounter so many people who will leave the doctors and the only thing that they came away with was not too bad for your age, but the high cholesterol and the high blood pressure and the fact you don't exercise and that, uh, and that you've got a lot of stress and the, and all of those things that, that were true that, that then the doctor kind of humanly kind of felt bad for giving all those ba that bad news. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make them feel okay. So when, but you're not bad for your age and they'll take away and carry that thing as their necklace. And uh, that thing is the brand that they walk away with. Oh, I'm, I'm actually not that bad for my age. And that was all I really cared about was where do I sit in my peer group, right? And so, um, but facing the truth of, okay, he said I've got high blood pressure. What does that mean? Well, it's the biggest killer in the world, right? So, um, so maybe I ought to look into what's changing that. And, and the, one of the reasons I focus on removal of habits is our current reality is created by the things that we are doing, not the things that we're not doing. Yeah? So life is cause and effect. Everything that we are experiencing is an output, not an input, right? It's our brain going, this stuff is an output based on the world that I see and how I'm interpreting it. And so this is the current output of the world that I'm living in, a cause and effect output. So how am I causing this effect? Blood, high blood pressure isn't a, a random attack. It's based on your actions. So as soon as you are willing to get really clear on those actions, what they are, just they're light bulb moments all over the place. Oh, I'm, it, I am a root cause of this stuff is a really powerful thing to to do the more blame you're willing to take for the stuff that's going on in your life the more in control of it you are yeah yeah responsibility um starts the uh, starts the change totally totally in fact that that's one of the uh, one of the big difficulties we've we have in the, in the u.s is the the whole concept of the pill for the ill and uh you just go, you get, uh, you get exonerated for your problems because everyone else has high blood pressure or everyone else is pre-diabetic. And uh, so really it's, you know, you're right, you're not bad for your age, but, but if we think back globally, think, if we think back generations, you know, it was just, just back to the 1960s. I mean, in 1960, the rate of diabetes was seven times less in the US, I'm, I'm not sure about the stats for, for Europe, but, um, and you can, you can look at that. So you could say nowadays, the average person is, is overweight, pre-diabetic, uh, probably hypertensive, and not bad for their age. But does that really mean, what does that really mean, right? 
you know, yeah, absolutely. as far as human potential and as far as, you know, I try to, I, I enjoy working with people myself who are, who are, you know, I, I get them to, to try to think about that with questions and, uh, and then also think about what are you missing out on that, and what do you, what is your future self missing out on? Do you ever work on, talk about future self and future possibilities um, to, to break, to get people to, to look down the road? Do you know what? Um, I, I'm not averse to, to people goal setting, to, to deciding where they, where they would like to be, but, but I don't spend a huge amount of attention on it because if you're deciding to go to London, you don't need to constantly check in with the fact you're going to London, right? You're, it, that's simple. You, that's your goal. That's the place that you're heading to. But, um, but men in particular, uh, I, I won't attempt the biblical scripture of it, right? But, uh, but Genesis talks about the curse of man is that I'm going to, you're going to be forever stuck in the future. And so, uh, my work is very much focused on the present and feeling how you want to feel in the present tends to result in you aligning with where you're going to be going anyway. Okay. That's brilliant. I like that. Yeah. It is very easy to get stuck in the future, get stuck in the present. And, uh, um, so some, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a fascinating way to look at it. So, um, Ed, I was just, I was looking at your blog this morning early before everyone woke up here. Uh, I hope you can't hear my son yelling right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. But, yeah, okay. That's, so the, the, door is, the door is working. We've got two doors closed between us. So you mentioned, uh, well, in fact, your, your last, one of your articles that, uh, you've got some great titles in, on your blog. So I'd encourage everyone to go to edlay.net and uh, check out your, your articles. They've, some really wonderful what, different things that you that you don't often see but for example you have the you have one about the better things get the better things can get can you tell us a little about that concept yeah yeah absolutely and, and i'll i'll take this in in reverse and, and use myself um i i stopped drinking in january stopped drinking alcohol as part of a as part of a 30 day thing and before that maybe i'd have um a let's say in the summer months i might have a bottle or two little bottles of beer in, in the sun and kind of enjoy that to, and relaxing with the with the family and long before that i used alcohol as a means to be able to be comfortable communicating with people right it was a, it was a social thing that I know I've got I've got recollection of my first ever interactions with alcohol and literally waiting for people to not be looking and throw bottles into the hedge, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and not enjoying that, but knowing that that I needed the medicine in order to fit in with people to be doing the same as them and probably to be feeling in such a way that kind of made me feel that alive state, right? And that was the start. And then there was some heavy consumption in late teens and early 20s. And then there was changes in environment and different families and, uh, you know, having a family and moving away from things that, but still in kind of like the health arena or moving into the health arena. arena. And this kind of arc of, of alcohol, but still using it as a tool when when used and and what eventually happened is that um i can still do it now but i've become completely untethered from its need right uh, it i can i can be the person that i need wanted to be while i was on it and i can enjoy it but i don't need it anymore for for any purpose and though that that came in an arc. And if somebody tries to go from here to here, there are so many lessons that you end up missing. Um, that, um, I mean, the way that our brain develops can develop new habits is by neuroassociation. Basically, that's how we learn is we attach 
something new in inside our neural pathways and our neural pathways are basically just the concepts and stories that exist in our world that we tell and a new habit is like reading a, your beginner's idiot guide to science and then picking, picking up a book on quantum physics they're so far apart that this is not going to make any sense and it will go away but neuro association is i do this and it makes sense within my world and and it just slowly builds right and it you could use diet as an explanation as well and go okay so the person this person's got what we've called the worst diet in the world and we're going to switch them to the best diet in the world but all of their neuro associations and their joys and their love is built around this diet and you're basically going to be sw swapping love for grief if you try and take them over here but there's so much to be gained so much to be gained by making a minimum effective dose change to what they're already doing and they'll feel better and they'll upgrade and their brain will make stories around this new thing with low effort and then when they're there and they're settled they can go okay what's next and what's next and what's next and actually this approach the neuro association approach approach gets you here more rapidly than trying to get here mm -hmm. trying to jump to here ends up being a try fail lower self-esteem try with lower self-esteem fail mm -hmm. try with even lower self-esteem fail even quicker right because you're just creating this constant reinforcement that you're not good enough to be here whereas when you take the step the neuro associated smallest step you start feeling incrementally better and this momentum just builds in every area of your life so the better it gets the better it can the better get. It gets, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. The so it's you're you're allowing your brain to adapt to the to the benefit of the new ha the small habit with the minimum effective dose and and then then you open up this curiosity of well that worked and so you're building confidence in one's own ability to change. Is that right? Absolutely. Confidence and curiosity are just the remedy to to everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that. That's exactly. Um, I can now see. I, you know, believe it or not, I was can remember failing um, ninety percent of the time as a personal trainer back in nineteen ninety. I was creating the pilot program for a hospital-based wellness center, and when I say failing, I mean the people came in. Uh, they paid their bills, they stayed with the center, they got social validation, but really uh, only one out of 10 was really making a, a transformation in their, in their health and fitness. And, uh, and it was, be and I can now see what we were, because we were trying to change the whole thing you know, and their brain was resisting all of these changes. And uh, so it was a rare person that could go you know, and change, uh, you know, I think one of the guys was an, was an ex, uh, like Marine or something, you know, and he had let himself go, but in his deep in his, in his past, he had been very fit. And, uh, so he could return to that. Whereas the other people had not ever really been fit. So they're, I guess they were, uh, anchored into that, um, into that self image, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, that, that's a really powerful thing, right? Those, those testimonials, those before and afters, they come from people who, let's say, either believe that they're doing the right things, but they're slightly off track, right? Um, so I would, get, I would get lawyers in the UK that believed they were doing all the right things, but actually they were just following the standard UK diet that was a porridge breakfast, a sandwich at lunch, and a pasta evening meal but they truly believe they were doing the right things, right? So that person, if you just go, hey, here's a little bit of evidence, they're off. They're mm -hmm. off a million miles down the road, chick, chick, this is my before and after picture. And then, you know, the same thing for the, let's say, the, the Marine who was doing everything most of their life in order to produce health, who then has a bad experience, let's say, of life, is feeling down, is depressed, you know, they've had some sort of experience, but they mentally come out the other side and say, I'm ready 
they've already hit that switch and then all of a sudden we go oh yeah that was it was me that that did that but they'd already made the switch they were just looking for the the hand to to help them along and and i've got a whole host of before and afters from 15 years ago that looked a lot like that as well right right yeah those are those those people are sometimes i found it was just trying to hold them back so they wouldn't injure themselves because they were so <laughs> so motivated and so going ho oh, and they wanted to come in to come in and train twice a week and they wanted to cut their calories more and i had to keep telling them listen you're going to you're going to actually you know go into a tailspin um, if you um, if you you know you you have to give your have the recovery well you know all this stuff so sure. yeah let's uh, let's Let's let me ask you about another one. Another one of the articles that really got my attention was, um, well, this is actually totally related. Um, your latest one on that uh, you t you write, wrote about, uh, you'll never create a life you love by doing things that you hate, basically. And uh, can you t maybe give us? A, do you have any stories of, that you could share about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the principle the principle behind that is that. Um, habits are formed in the basal ganglia in your brain, okay? Uh, among other regions, the basal ganglia is what allows something to become a habit. And it will only allow something to become a habit if, um, if it deems that habit to be easier than the other thing. Basically, our brain is lazy, so it wants to create simple prediction and response and patterns. And it aligns with what we deem as success not what we rationally de deem as success by looking out there right but what we actually deem as success so increased connection increased hierarchy feeling better with lower kind of brain tax right can i be more lazy and move towards that thing and what we tend to get from those things in response is a happiness feeling right we're just kind of, we're a collection of neurochemicals. And let's say uh, one of us is oxytocin led and oxytocin love hormone means that if I can clearly see an increase in connection from this new behavior, then I'll do it. As long as it isn't too much harder work than the thing before. And then the other thing might be, am I dopamine led? Um, do I love the chase? Do I love running after things and winning? And if I can see an increase in hierarchy based on this new thing, then I'm going to get the reward feelings, right? And so if I get those, that type of feedback, basically the thing that makes me feel enjoyment, then enjoy based on having done that thing, I'm going to do that thing. But if I had to put in disproportionate effort to what I was doing before, and I'm not getting disproportionate amounts more joy, then I'm not going to accept it in my basal ganglia as a habit. So what does that mean? Well, if I'm doing something that makes me go, I'm really going to do it this time. I'm really motivated. I've got the willpower this time. I'm more disciplined than me last year, last year before that. If we're having to create the internal feeling of momentum to do it, what we're saying is I don't really want to do it. Motivation basically means trying to get myself to do the thing that I don't really want to do. Whereas if we go, yeah, actually, I'm excited about doing this thing. And those are the words we're using around it. I'm excited to see what's going to come of it. Um, because of the setup path that I structured before, I've got this real clarity around, actually, I don't think this is going to be that hard. You know, I want everybody, when I sit down with them in that first diagnosis session, to go, this is going to be really easy. I had no idea how, we, but I can already feel that this habit has been created. My brain's just looking for the proof that it's being created in the doing. Yeah, uh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I can see why people like working with you, Ed. It's um, you've got a unique, um, you know, skill set and knowledge base that uh, that goes much beyond just the pure fitness and. Uh, and nutrition that um, you know many that many folks uh, have in in the in the world of health and fitness. So, um, and when would if I could 
ch and, and I know we're gonna we're, we're getting short on time here, and I know you're you're a busy guy yourself. Um, I did want to circle in, if I could, a, a question about um, any advice for fathers out there um, who uh, who are finding finding it hard to balance that they have a they feel guilty about not having enough time for the kids if they're going to exercise, especially in quarantine, because they're they're at home and they feel like, oh, I'm I'm working, and if I also take another you know, another block of time to exercise. I'm taking that away from the kids. Any, any uh, suggestions on, on strategies to help that situation? Yes. Um, so nothing that, uh, that we, we have a misrepresentation of time is that time is the thing that people want and time is the thing that is of greatest benefit, whether giving to ourselves or giving to somebody else. When the truth is that people represent to us what they want as time, but what they really want is attention. Mm -hmm. So your child will most benefit from deep focused attention. And when they've got the attention that they need, you'll get time back, right? But when they fail to get the attention that they need, they'll keep asking for time. And that goes for yourself. That goes for your partner. Um, so let's say you want to exercise. If you get up first thing in the morning, and you do 10 minutes of really simple exercise, 15 minutes of really simple exercise, then you will have given yourself specific focused attention on exercise. But if you just keep telling yourself that you want time to exercise and you're going to wait for a spare window of time to exercise, you will carry that thought and the emotion around it with you all day like baggage. Mm -hmm. And yes. your brain, and you'll keep trying to push people away from you. And the same is true of your children. Go all in focus on what they want to be doing, do the thing that they want to be doing. And then they will go, I've got that thing that I needed. And now I need some time on my own. I need to go away and, and do that thing. Um, and so uh, it's attention, give attention, not, not time and you'll get time back. Yeah. That's, that would be my biggest tip. Uh, great advice. Great advice. I've actually, I've, I've been working on, on a, I uh, have a new, a new strategy too related to that. And that's, is I bring my son, this is my office slash fitness studio here. So I bring my son in and we just make it playtime. And uh, so I don't, I have to give up the idea of this, you know, regimented workout with, uh, you know, monitoring heart rate and, and uh, tracking everything. It's just, I just, you know, I don't need that really. And um, just work at just practicing on staying on moving and uh, trying to also share that time with him. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, he's also, you know, develop. I'm hoping to develop that habit in him. So he'll come to me now, and he says, "Papa," you know, because um, he speaks Spanish. He uh, he's fluent in Spanish and English, but he tends to mix them. So he says, "Papa," Spanglish. you know, <laughs> Spanglish, yeah, "Papa," let's go, you know. And he, he, the bicycle, it's, he, he's, he economizes the word. So in Spanish, it's BC. So it's easier to say BC than, than bicycle. You know? So he'll say, Papa, BC and push-ups. And Papa, BC and push-ups. And so he, I, he's got that anchored in his brain now. So it's all the time. He'll just come up and say, and more than I even want to, because... Uh, <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to do it every day. You know, I'm into minimalism. And uh, so, uh, but, I, but I will do it with him. You know, we'll just do other things or we'll, you know, just get on, put the mats on the floor and uh, he jumps on my back and we just wrestle, you know. And uh, so it's a lot of fun. That's worked out well when he, now that he's big enough to do that. He's a big three sure. and a half year old. <laughs> yeah, my kids, um, they, uh, we, they have what we call Dinglish, right? Which is a mixture of Danish and English. Oh, okay. And uh, which, uh, which has been really enlightening, right? Because uh, I spent 15 years in the UK with my wife, who's, who's Danish. With all of these kind of strange turns of phrases, I think, that just makes no sense. And, 
and got frustrated by those things and would, would correct them. And now I see my kids falling into exactly the, those same patterns, which has been really helpful for me, right? Um, but, uh, but what we do with our kids is, um, particularly when we were in lockdown, um, more so than we are now, like our schools have started going back and stuff. Um, but when we were homeschooling, um, we would make the last 15 minutes of every hour something physical. So whether it was crawling, whether it was a yoga, kids YouTube thing, or, or you know, going out for a, a walk or even a run together, maybe just play, playing some, uh, some ball in the house, something like that we do something physical and actually it, it paid dividends in both their ability to focus on the schoolwork and you get really get a clear idea of actually schools aren't doing it the best. I mean, we know that schools aren't doing it the best way possible for, for your individual child. Right. But, right. but when you learn that the balancing that physical and mental was kind of really, really the difference between are they frustrated for hours on end or are they actually absorbing stuff that they can repeat at the end of the day? It's just such a phenomenal difference. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea though. Every, the last, uh, the last 15 minutes of every hour, you know, it, it makes perfect sense. You take a break from your, you know, from a mental focus and go do something physical and uh, it's a nice structure and, and uh, breaks up the monotony of the day and get the activity in very, I'm, Definitely gonna. I'm gonna bring that to uh, to the to the table here for lunch pretty soon and mention that to my wife. So, <laughs> and uh, last last question, if uh, that I wanted to throw also about kids, uh, how do you how do you deal with screen time issues? Uh, well, I guess that uh, depends on what what do you what would you call a screen time issue? Well, what we're finding is that the that that our son is attracted to all the, to the screens. I mean, whether it's the phone, because we've got some learning app, some learning apps, uh, like lingo kids, it's quite good. And, uh, but if it's not, if it's not that it's, it's a computer, um, with YouTube and kids programming and things like that. And, uh, I think he's getting a dopamine hit from all these things. So he's really getting pulled into those and it, we're constantly having to, so no, no, not now, not now. And we're trying to dosify it, you know, and, uh, and keep it minimal up, keep it, you know, not make it the main focus of the day. But if, if we were to let him, I, he would be happy spending most of the day watching videos and, uh, and playing the, the, this learning, the learning games. Okay. So, um, first and foremost, you, you, you need to, um, create an understanding between you and your wife, what, what you actually think is good and what you actually think is bad, right? You could speak to some people that would say, um, you'd speak to some people that would say, I um, am going to let them have the iPad all of the time because the future is going to be technology. And you'll speak to some people who say, um, because of that dopamine, uh, fix issues I'm worried it's going to create brain development problems right and and so you decide in between yes the two extremes okay so you decide what what you what you truly believe and then you appreciate that a child of of that age and let's say below um, uh, below nine or ten has a very undeveloped prefrontal cortex so um, what we hope is that um, our emotions move us away from pain and towards pleasure. Mm -hmm. And maybe after seven, eight, nine, maybe even after six, particularly in girls, we'll start to create this. I will forego pleasure now to get longer term pleasure. And I will accept pain now to get longer term pleasure. And this is where we start building values, right? Um, and then hopefully as we're adults, the main consideration is outcome. You know, the thing that we want to experience. And, and sometimes that would run into problems there. But let's go back to children now. No prefrontal cortex means that what the best thing for developing your child is to have rules the same way you would for a pet. Mm -hmm. So if you go say to a pet, hey, you can go on the sofa at these times a day, but not these times. 
there's no way a pet is going no to understand way. that. Yeah. And so I'm not saying a child is a pet, but I'm, what I'm saying is they need exact, specific and precise rules that will always be true. So, um, so you can have in this window and no more, these are the only times of day that you can do this. Uh, and, and when you can do that around everything in a child's life, like th this, is, this is the rule around sweets and this is the rule around sleep and this is the rule around um, what's good behavior and what's bad behavior and go, we're gonna be rigid to these things and be consistent with them, then the child knows very, very, very quickly where they stand, right? So if you say, um, no iPad till after five o'clock, and then you get one hour, or what, you get 40 minutes, or you get half an hour. After a couple of days, the kids just go, oh, right, you stuck to it. The system I usually use of asking you 13 times, or getting upset, or whatever your child does, to manipulate you uh -huh. um, because they recognize patterns just as well as we recognize patterns, maybe even better. Um, so they just pull on those levers and then go, oh, actually, I just ask 11 times and then I get it. Um, as, as soon as we're rigid and consistent with those things, the child just falls in line and it's really good for their development as well. Yeah, no, that's, that's, um, that Brilliant stuff. That works. There's a, a, a Spanish psychologist actually that I'm reading his book that's right, right on there. He actually mixes neuroscience with child development and his name is Alvaro Bilbao and he's from Northern Spain. So oh, cool. uh, sounds like you, you, t you have, uh, you have the exact, almost sounds like you've read his book. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, Ed, listen, I really want to, uh, really want to thank you for taking, for your time today and uh this uh this interview has been fascinating and a lot of fun and uh I, it's gone longer than i expected time is <laughs> I, I may break it up into two but this will kind of um uh get our get the old get our get my youtube channel jump started again and uh and so i'm i'm honored to have you as part of the part of the uh the jump start well thank you very much send me a link i'd love to share it as well yeah absolutely absolutely i will do that and um it's going to be uh, it's got, probably going to be a, a couple of weeks um because we're going we've got another got the, a full slate of things with the new website and uh but uh, i will get uh, definitely send you the link and uh and and so the best place to find you for people out there and i'll put this in the show notes as well i guess that would be at your website edlay.net is that right Absolutely. And um, so that's uh, E-D-L-E-Y dot net. Um, and also um, LinkedIn. I'm quite active on LinkedIn, just Ed Lay. Okay, brilliant. And so if, if someone who was not in Denmark wanted to consult with you, is that something, is that, a, is that uh, do you also do, do, I guess, Zoom consulting as well? Absolutely. I have uh, clients in, in New York, Japan, Sydney, all over. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Ed, once again, big thank, big thank you. And uh, this has been brilliant. And um, we will, I'll be in touch as soon as we, we get this uh, edited and, and put up on the site. Thanks, Dan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>